You know, my, my dad told me that, that nobody's nobody's prayers as effective as your own. But that there's there's power in, in joining faith and you know uh, I appreciate that, that we have a place where we can come and we can join faith and that we can share our prayers and the things that are going on in our lives and and, uh, and get encouragement and get strength. You know, so sometimes these decisions get big and and intimidating and you know it's it's humbling for me to, to say I'm, I'm scared. It's it's a, it's a big it's a big deal to, to change your your whole family's life. But, <clears throat> Amen. Thank you for your prayer and support. We're going to be in John, the first chapter today. If you could go ahead and turn there. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Would you like to hear from that? Let's, let's, let's go ahead and pray. Those of you who are close by, come on. <laughs> Amen. Father, in Jesus, we just ask that you just take away any discomfort and pain. Lord, in Jesus, Father, we'll reduce the swelling. We'll reduce the time it takes to heal. Lord, Father, just make all the discomfort and pain go away. In Jesus, heal the nerves and the bones and the flesh, Lord, in Jesus' name, healing and strength, to the rehabilitation, Lord, that will regain strength, that will be better than you, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you for healing and strength, in Jesus' name, amen. So we've been leading up to this, discussing in, in the Old Testament the concept of the God governing, governing his people through um, the prophet, the priest, and the king. And through all of the messages and through all of my, my, my best intentions and <clears throat> through, you know, <laughs> You know the, the moving of the Holy Spirit and, and changing you know the message of Caesar. There's been some a few key points that I've overlooked. So we're going to try and recap some of the information that we already have in preparation for Sunday service now or for Easter service. Now I want to encourage everybody to go a little bit out of your way, not a lot out of your way, but go a little bit out of your way and bring somebody with you that wouldn't normally come. We know we're going to see a lot of faces around Easter, but I'm not talking about giving those because they're already going to come. Let's get somebody new, somebody different. Let's invite somebody. Don't go too far out of your way, but just go a little bit out of your way and see if you can't bring somebody. If you can't, that's no big deal, but it would be nice if you could. So I'm, I'm making the ask. If you could consider trying, that would be uh, a blessing. Not only in the church, but I believe it would be a blessing in your life as well. Um, <clears throat> so, as we've gone through and we've, we've talked about the, the, the different offices of the Old Testament, which God was using to govern his people, um, the, we'll, we'll start with, with, with the prophets. And with the, the, the prophetic order as it, as it is, you know, there were different types of prophets. We, we learned that there were prophets that did miracles. There were prophets that brought the word of the Lord. They were essentially ambassadors, right? Who would bring the word of the Lord to the king. And then it was typically up to the king to decide what the, the people were going to do, right? And so it was a big responsibility to be a prophet. And we, we study a, a very small percentage of the prophets that were actually arrived at the time. We study the ones where God used to make massive miracles, or, or God used to make pivotal words that were that that, 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 that pivotal decisions were made by the king. 
But there was this other group called the School of the Prophets, which were thousands of more prophets that we, we really didn't hear about. We, we, they were referred to as a group. But I mean, in terms of uh, actual ministry and reaching out to, the, to God's people, on a daily basis, they would minister to the people. They would help those that, that had needs. They would teach them how to live closer, uh, a more godly life. They, they had a more practical aspect of their ministry. And so we see the prophetic office in, 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 in bigger than what we, we, typically, we typically focus on. Right? We, we focus on the miracles of Elijah and, and the words of Jeremiah and, and Isaiah and, and Ezekiel. There, there's, there's a lot of power. There's a lot of, of key, pivotal, foundational um, knowledge, influence, and importance in those ministries. But I just wanted you to take a step back and, and know that there was a lot more prophets, and there was many more prophets that contributed to the word of God, to the to the, the, the people of God in the same time period. Amen. And so the prophet had this responsibility to adjust the, the intention or the will of the king to understand clearly what God wanted. And the king's responsibility was to understand what his people wanted and understand what God wanted. And then understand if make a decision. What, what, what is he going to do? Because it's not very often that the, the multitude wants to do what God wants the king to do, right? If you put it in context of Moses, Moses said, you know, let's all go up. And they said, no, 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 we want to stand as far back as possible because the, the conviction of the, the power of God, they're, they're, the, the multitude in the Bible is always requested as much distance as possible from the presence of God. And it's really no different today. If we go out and we start preaching the word, you know, there's going to be distance between us and the next person. <laughs> there's not a lot of people. I saw, I saw a comic one time, and it said, you know, how to get a, the, 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 the comic was how to get a good seat on the bus or the train or something like that. And there was this guy, and he was wearing a t-shirt and said, ask me about Jesus. Right, and there was nobody sitting next to him on either side, and he could, he could, it could, it could be isolating, right? But that 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 doesn't it doesn't mean that it's 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 different. Or wrong. It, just, it just means that it's hard to reach the multitude because we're saying things that they don't want to hear. So as a king, you're responsible for the for the, the their obedience, right? You're not, the, the, the high priest, well, we'll talk about the atonement and actually bridging that gap, but for the, the, the decision of the, of the king is which way is this people going to go? Are we going to go in the in right standing with God and, and accept the blessing? Or are we going to go the way that everyone, that, that feel, that's easier, that feels better, that's probably, you know, less resistance right now, and, and deal with, it, with the consequences and deal with the wrath of God. You continually, as, we, as you study the Old Testament, you see these kings making these decisions, and the, the, it, it creates these cycles, right? There's a, there's a point in time where there's a decision to make, and the prophet comes and says, if you do this, then blessing. If you do this, then curse. And the decision is made. Sometimes it's a blessing, and they win the war. Or, or, or other times, it's and they, they make the wrong decision, and they get overthrown. But it's... It's a physical representation of what we deal with in the spirit now, right? That, that, that is the entire Old Testament, is God demonstrating his principles, demonstrating his character. He's showing us who he is within physical understanding or physical situations so that we can understand. Otherwise, if we don't have something to relate to, then that biblical principle gets lost on us because we don't understand. We don't have a physical um, uh, example to relate to, to understand a, a spiritual concept, a, a biblical concept, a God's concept, amen? A principle, biblical principle. And so <clears throat> that leaves us with the, 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 the high priest, right? The, or the priesthood. And this is where I want to spend a little bit more time because of the, the importance of, of the fulfillment of the priesthood in, in Jesus. But 
At the same time, <clears throat> there were a couple of things that I left out that I wanted to make sure that I, I, I double back with because I want to kind of fill in the blanks. It will all come together next week. But I want to give you as much foundational knowledge as possible so so that you can you can get the most out of out of uh, the Easter sermon, amen. So my dad beat me up this week, and he told me I, I, I I'm doing too much. I gotta, I gotta slow down, I gotta, I gotta not get so excited. I can't really say those words, but he said when I get excited, I tend to leave things out and 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 I try and cover too much. So we gotta we're gonna slow down a little bit today. We're gonna just do a few. Might might end up being really short, but it's okay. But the priesthood is important, especially when you're talking about the fulfillment of the priesthood and Jesus. Because it's it is a, a concept that is is fundamental in how God wants us to understand our purpose. What well, wants God wants us to understand how this all happened, why this all happened, and how how to how to correct all this. And we, we go back to the to the original sin, and you know we, we talk about Adam and Eve eating the fruit. And <clears throat> I'm going to say this as softly as I can, but just hear me out before we jump to conclusions, and I'll I'll bring it back around. I promise. Hear me out. <clears throat> so the, there's there's a principle in everything that we learn in the Bible. And there's a, there's a reason why that when Adam and Eve were presented with, with the, the opportunity for eternal life in the presence of God, it, it, it wasn't a choice. That's the way they were born. Amen. They were born in perfection. God created them and they were perfect. Amen? And then God gave them a choice. And that it's not to be said that, that, that God allowed imperfection in his perfect child, his perfect uh, creation. But then we have to remember that we were formed in the dust of the ground. And then he breathed into our, our nostrils the, the breath of life, the spirit of life. And then we became a living soul. So he, 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 he made all the ingredients. And then he put us together. And then he gave us life. And he gave us a choice. And then the choice became to eat of the, the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil, right? And it, it wasn't when Eve ate the fruit, it was when Adam ate the fruit that there became a division, which makes us take pause and try to understand that. But again, we're, we're following a biblical principle of what God wants us to understand about his character, right? That, that we can greater have a, a better understanding of his character and his personality and who he is by understanding that there's a structure with everything with God. And it wasn't that Adam was greater than Eve or, or, or that Eve was different than, than Adam. It was that they, they both ate and but with God told Adam, don't do this. Right? One had the responsibility. But the fact that there was two means something. Because if one was so was, was perfect, it would have been enough. But there was two for a reason. Because God wanted to give us, give man, the understanding of companionship, of communion, of, of love. There's a, there's a demonstration there. There's a principle there that speaks of God's character. And it's important to acknowledge because it's, it's there. But based on this concept, that rolls out all of the other structure and responsibility throughout the Old Testament and consequently in the New Testament as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental principle that I wanted to point out. That it, it's a, a, our view of God is, is not complete if we think it's only 
structure. We think it's only rebuke or it's only obedience. It's only it's not. It's love. It's communion. It's intimacy. It's being fruitful and multiplying and, and being prosperous. Those are all biblical principles that sometimes get isolated and people only want to talk about one at a time. But they all, all those principles came from this specific time, written in the very beginning. It's, it's very important that we acknowledge this. Because as we apply that concept to the priesthood, all the, 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 the three different categories of priesthood, right? They started with the patriarchal priesthood, and then there was the Levitical priesthood, and then there was the eternal priesthood, right? So let's start with the, the patriarchal priesthood. Patriarchal priesthood said that the, 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 the father, right, was the, the priest. He was responsible. In essence, the, the patriarchal priesthood, the father was the prophet, the priest, and the king. Because God was governing a family, it was still a people of God that were separated by Abraham. We remember how that happened. God chose Abraham and said, today you're different. Circumcise him, and the next day, it was God's people. Everybody, everyone of Abraham's seed from that point on was different. But then, throughout the rest of the Bible, everybody refers to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because they knew God because their father knew God. And how difficult a life. And thank God I don't know it. But if your father doesn't know God, it changes everything in your life. But because my father knew God, and because your father knows God, and as we allow God to, to be our father, amen, we begin to understand the structure that is important in the priesthood. That there, there is an, an importance on understanding your, your influence, where you come from, what you're, you're currently responsible for, and how that affects everybody that comes after you. Amen. And so, with the with the priesthood, there was this there was this gap after the sin, and and God separated Abraham, and He said, "We're going to start to try and put this thing back together." Amen. <clears throat> and then. Through the, through, through the years, through down through Moses, when they say when Moses came and brought, brought the, uh, the, the Jews out of Egypt, there was about a million, maybe a little bit more. It became a nation, right? And then the, the structure changed. And, and God began to demonstrate his power through miracles, through wonders. But then, as, as the nation grew, and prosperity and the promise group. Remember, the promise was always great, but now they were getting prepared to take that promise, to walk in that promise, to be given that promise, to be responsible for that promise. There had to be some preparation, there had to be some structure, there had to be a, a plan. Amen? And so he started moving the pieces into place. Then he gave them gave Moses the instructions for the tabernacle. And then he, they had a meeting place in there. And Aaron took the, the Levites and, and, and trained them up according to this. And I, I love the, and I'm a very visual person, right? So I just, the first time that they started to do these sacrifices, I could just see Aaron looking at the book and maybe now it's the next step. You know, step 34, <laughs> step 52, whatever and trying to get everything just right because every single act was important. It was significant. It was, and it was difficult to live that life. At the same time, no matter what calling you have on your life, or no matter what life you have, wherever you find yourself, it's difficult to live a godly life. It's difficult to be different, to be separated, and to, to do the right things all the time. And, and thankfully, God doesn't require us to be perfect. He does require us to be accountable. 
But the beauty of this, this, and you'll see where I'm going in a second. The beauty of all of this is that if we have it, the structure is put out in front of us. We're standing on it today. Where we have everything that we need in terms of, of knowledge, instructions, understanding, promise. God has given us all that we we are not living out the Bible. These people had to learn the hard way. We get to learn from, but from their mistakes, from their decisions, from their life. We get to understand. We get to see God descending on His people, and we get to see the details. We get to see the, His His consistency. We get to see how God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That. We, we can stand on that and know that God is going to be for be there for us tomorrow. Which is a blessing in my life right now. Amen. Having the confidence and knowing that he already showed up for me. I'm, I'm reminded of the, the story we learned about in Legion. And <clears throat> the, 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 the apostles or the disciples were they, they were just ministering to on the hill, hundreds of people got healed. And they, they, that night, they jump in the boat, and there's a storm. And the disciples are going crazy and worried, and they wake up Jesus, and he says, "You have no faith." He says, "Peace be still." And then they show up on the shore on the other side. The sea's calm. And here comes Legion, right? And this guy was full of devils. He was kept himself. And he was living in a tomb. And Jesus delivered them. And the, the, you know, the demons jumped into pigs and they ran, in the, they ran off the cliff into the ocean. But that's, that's not the most powerful part of the story for me. Because Legion wanted to go with Jesus. And Jesus said, no, you've got to go back and tell everywhere, everybody where you came from about how you've been blessed, and how, about how you've been delivered, how you've been set free. And then Jesus gets back on the boat and goes back where he came from. Jesus risked all of his, his disciples, all of his friends, through a storm he knew was going to happen to one person. And God put the team together to come get you. God put the team together to come get me. He showed up for us. And he fought all of our battles. And it's important for you to understand how he did it. He took on the full authority, all of the responsibility, all of the accountability, all of the power, all of the burden, all of everything for being our prophet, for being our priest, for being our king. So that when he showed up, all the bases would be covered. He was the only one that ever walked that was that was perfect. I've heard people say all the time, well, if I were Adam, or if Moses was Adam, or even Abraham was Adam, it wouldn't matter who was Adam. Nobody could ever be as great as the original creation of God. I don't care how big ego you got. It doesn't matter. But he showed up. He showed up. And it, I, I've asked you guys to turn to John. We'll end a little bit. We'll, we'll, we'll read it eventually. I've been mean, answering some of the open and praying. I'm almost done. You're wonderful. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And it was like and the life was the light of men. 
a steam wire type of thing. Did I do anything to that real quick? Thank you. He smiled at me. I'm not in trouble. So not only was was Jesus everything that we needed for, forever. He humbled himself from perfection, from the Godhead, from all powerful, uh, omnipotent, mutable, all of the, the big words that I can't spell. All of those things. He humbled himself to become something else, to solve our problem, and to prove to us that what we what we learned in the Old Testament, all of that was true. Everything that he demonstrated about his character and his will and his personality became true the second that Jesus showed up for us. Because he didn't have to do it. He knew what he was getting into, and he did it anyway. He knew what he was giving up, but he did it anyway. He knew about all the pain, all the suffering. He had, he understood how hard it was going to be to live in a, in a flesh, to live in a hurt suit, to deal with temptation, to deal with struggle and doubt, and to deal with all of the emotions that were created by the fall. He understood that was going to be harder than, than any life that, we have, that we've ever seen since. And it was harder because he was successful. He accomplished the goal. He was not, he was not only everything that we needed, he was the most successful human ever. And so, he shows up for us to prove he would do what he said he was going to do. Regardless of all the pain and all the suffering, he did it. In verse 9 it says, that was the, the true life which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Somebody say, every man that come, comes into the world. There's a lot of people that think that Jesus only died for certain people. He died for everybody. Don't ask me to do the math, but the promise is right here. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. That's the same knowledge, the same intimacy where, where, that, they, they used, that God used in the, in the Old Testament where he says in Adam knew Eve. That is the intimate relationship that, that the Lord wants to have with us. It is not just this concept of I'm, in, I'm me and I'm strong and I'm, God is my strength. And there's, there's an intimacy there. There's a softness there. There's a love there. There's a dynamic that we can learn together because it's powerful. I'll show you how powerful. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. He gives us power to become like him. He is the son of God. We, 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 we learned the concept previously. That the, the blessing is on us, the second son. Right? Yeah. It is. Oh, it is. When, and, so the, the, the blessing wasn't on Jacob, it was on Esau, it wasn't on Ishmael, it was on Isaac, so on and so forth. If you go through Solomon's or David's first first uh, son who died with uh, Bathsheba and was Solomon, it was constantly the blessing was on the second son in the Old Testament. That one was it's very consistent. Read it, it's interesting. We, we talked about it briefly, I referenced it. But as it pertains to us, the blessing wasn't on Adam. The blessing was on Jesus. Yeah. And how that translates into our life is we are required to be born again. Verse 13 says, which were born, so he's going to give these 
the, the people that believe power to be sons of God, which were born not of blood, nor of the, the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We've got to be born of God. We've got to submit. Clearly, we've been born in the flesh. We live in the world and we have a will learned in Ezekiel the God. Submitting our will, right? We've got to submit our will so that we're not, that's not our life. That's not what we're born of. That's not what I did. That, but that's not our identity. That's not what drives us. We're born of God. We are born again. That, that, that term has been so tainted with, with craziness from across the spectrum. But I'd like us to get back to its root of what it really means to be born again is to be for our flesh to die and our spirit to live. Because he showed up for us. On Palm Sunday, he showed up for us. There's, there's, there isn't an analogy in the world that will truly like, complete the, the, the concept for me anyway. That this man, knowing who he is, knowing what he's tasked to do, the weight of every man that ever entered into the world on his shoulder, every single one, all the ones that were going to believe in him and live, all the ones probably more so that weren't. Those burdens as he stood on the hill on Palm Sunday deciding I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up and I'm going to go through this so that no one will ever have to. I'm going to fight every battle ever so that they'll have the victory. I'm going to take these stripes so that they can be healed. Jesus showed up for us. <clears throat> and it, it, it's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. But it, it brings us all together. I'm going to try and get through without crying like a baby. 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld this glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was perfect. He covered us all. Next week we're going to, we're going to talk about how it all went down. What? Not necessarily the, 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 the death, burial, and resurrection, but what happened when Jesus died? What prophet is the fulfillment of all of the prophecies of, uh, of Jesus' life, all at once in the death, burial, and resurrection? And it's such an exciting story. But we're going to talk about the, the, the promises and how the fulfillment of the, the, those three offices the prophet, the priest, and the king in, in the life and death of burial and resurrection of Jesus empowers us. The promise in here in John 1 says, He gave us power to become just like Him. And He is the prophet, the priest, and the king. I don't want to preach next week's message today. I will. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it short. We're, we're a little bit early to, today, but I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm scared to death Amen. about we, 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 pray, we pray about change. It's not important. 